Bridging Gaps, the business podcast with Deborah Levitt, sharing the challenges and stories of fellow business owners. On this episode, I'm joined by Tom Watson, a Canadian entrepreneur, founder of Recreational Excellence and Your Better Life, as well as the best-selling author of Man's Shoes. He's also a sought-after international speaker, consultant, and television personality. It's really, it's really great to have you on the show. How are you? Doing very well, Deborah. How are things there in uh, the sunny part of the UK? Well, it is actually sunny at the moment, though there is a big black cloud hanging over that looks like it's about to, to pour down, but that's fairly typical for where I am. <laughs> <laughs> we just, uh, my wife and Kathy and I just got home from Mexico late last night, and uh, so we spent uh, seven, eight days in the sun, and uh, we arrived home to uh, a large downpour of rain ourselves, so living on the west coast of Vancouver, it's uh, uh, probably a little bit more like uh, living over where you're living and uh, we did meet some great folks from uh, England who were talking a lot about snow and rain and and that kind of stuff we chuckled about the snow part because of course coming from Canada we know we know our sh- fair share about the snow so I know people that to me initially they say oh well you must be really used to it and I said well Vancouver used to be very much like the you know London this area and not get very much. But in the past few years, you've really had to deal with a lot more on a regular basis, haven't you? Yeah, yeah. You know, it's that uh, global warming that we're in. (laughs) Yeah, which makes everything colder, which makes perfect sense to me. Um, So, Tom, I know that you've got quite a number of different businesses and things. You've got Recreation Excellence, Your Better Life. You're a best-selling author and also a speaker. So I was wondering if you could just tell our listeners a little bit about, you know, what it is that you do. Well, I started out my career uh, 30 years ago as a recreation manager in Canada, um, working for municipalities, working for the city. Um, spent about 10, 12 years uh, working my way up in, in municipal government. Um, got a bit tired of being stuck in a box. And uh, so I jumped out of that and, and uh, I had a, a harebrained idea that I could actually manage recreation facilities, which are all owned by the municipalities, the cities here in Canada. I could actually form a private company and actually compete uh, very well. And my goal there was to actually increase uh, customer service. So create teams, which is what I specialize in, customer service, uh, custom, I call it customer experience, uh, but by building strong teams. Um, so 20 years ago, Kathy and I, my wife and I uh, formed a company, Recreation Excellence, and uh, we began selling that concept to municipalities and, and uh, we've done very well with that. Um, In the past kind of uh, decade, I would say, um, you know, uh, wanting to help people uh, live better lives, um, we decided to create this online forum or a community, and that's Your Better Life. And uh, really, Your Better Life is, is about breaking our lives down into kind of seven life zones, we call them. And we have experts that blog in and, and, and uh, in the various areas, uh, the various life zones, um, give people ideas and inspiration, how they can balance their life out and, and be more successful. So that's uh, been interesting to, to kind of take that journey, which is more of an online, I'm not a computer, computer IT geeky guy. Uh, (laughs) so I've had lots of help that way, but it's, it's really turned out to be a lot of fun and very enjoyable, very inspirational for myself. Uh, but I think for a lot of the people that are, have become community members. And I also leverage that uh, Your Better Life um, platform to be my speaking platform as well. Um, and my books are sold off of there and that kind of stuff. So uh, it's, a, it's a diverse kind of profile that we've grown over the years, but uh, I really enjoy it. Excellent. And it's, it's a lot to juggle. It's a lot of, you know, different things added to which, you know, being, you know, husband, father, grandfather now, how do you make sure that you keep all of those things going without sacrificing, well, any of them and also not sacrificing yourself? Well, you know, Deborah, I, I often think about, 
being an entrepreneur, a, a little bit different than work-life balance. I, I, I really tend to believe in, in the concept of, of work-life integration. And um, I think uh, many times we kind of come out of the corporate you know, work world and we think we, you know, we work from eight till five or whatever, whatever our shifts are. Uh, Monday to Friday or Tuesday to Saturday, you know, we work these hours, then we come home and we do family. Um, for me, uh, I think being an entrepreneur is taking advantage of, uh, you know, if, if you can, 24 hours of a day and prioritizing uh, what's really important to you. What, what are you trying to accomplish in your life? We have one life to live and what what do you want your legacy to be? Um, much of my work happens at very odd hours of the day um, because I might want to be off at my grandson's uh, play this morning for, at school uh, where, you know, 25 years ago, I would have been off to work and I would have had to have been trying to tell my boss why I needed to take time off to go to my grandson's play. Uh, well, in my world, I tell my boss, which is me, I'm going to flex my time. I'm going to go to my grandson's play, and this evening I'm going to work till 8 o'clock at night. Uh, and I'm going to flex my time, and I'm going to integrate my work life with my, my home life. And, uh, and I'm going to, when I'm dealing with my family and being with my family, I'm just going to be with them. I'm, I'm not going to worry about my, my work. But when I'm at work, I'm going to worry about my work. I'm going to really be intentional and focus on my work. So it's this work-life integration um, where you can do things. Uh, I can go for a walk during the day. I uh, think I'm on a walk, and then I run into somebody who is on a walk, and we get into a conversation, and all of a sudden I jump back into, oh, so you you run uh, company XYZ, Um I do this, uh, any chance we might partner. And uh, so it's this work-life integration. And I really believe work-life integration is one of the great benefits of being an entrepreneur, if you think of it that way. Uh, and you have to get your family to think of it that way as well. I mean, you have to have, I've had to get Kathy on board with this idea that I don't, I, I don't actually work a regular day. I don't, I don't. Um, and there's great benefits to her for that as well. So, so I would encourage all entrepreneurs to really kind of rebrand your thinking into work-life integration or something, some phrase like that, which gets you out of a corporate way of thinking that I need to work from this time to this time to be successful. Because you can work, if you're, if you're an IT guy or, you know, a lot of younger people coming up, a lot of our millennials, they actually work better at 11 o'clock at night than they do at 11 o'clock in the morning. You know, so if they're branded into a corporate way of thinking, uh, they're they're thinking about I got to go to work at eight. I got to come home at five, you know, and then they're up till two in the morning because they don't sleep until two in the morning. So entrepreneurs embrace work life integration. And I know that for me personally, well, one, it was quite difficult coming out of corporate and and accepting that I could work when I wanted to. And that as long as, you know, obviously you've got to balance that with when your clients need you and things as well. But but also I'm not a morning person and never have been. And I've realized that I work a lot better if I start around 10. So I, I aim to start my working day around 10. And what that actually means is that quite often I start earlier, but it's almost like a freedom to to. Th to do it as a, you know, so as you said, when you bump into that person who's on a walk, you know, something just triggers a thought and then I'm happily going into it rather than feeling forced into having to have been up at eight or, you know, somewhere else at whatever particular time. So for you, when you, when you left that um, municipal job and you decided to, to make this leap to go out on your own, did you find sort of right away that you were able to, to take that entrepreneurial view and say, no, actually, this is the way I'm going to work? Or did you find that you had to go through a transition until you reached mm -hmm. the stage where you are now? Well, I wish I would have been able to make the transition, like turning the light switch on and off, but I, I didn't. And, uh, and so I think it's one of the, big, the biggest things that I've learned in this journey of entrepreneurialism is that, uh, you 
you can make this transition and you actually to be successful you need to actually mentally and physically make that transition uh, i i was trying to approach you know uh, i was very successful when i worked for municipalities so i mean uh, first off people were wondering what the heck i was doing leaving a, a, a career job six-figure job um and uh moving away from the security and of, of working for municipalities and pension plan and extended health plans and all that kind of stuff. I mean, um, but, you know, I also was approaching it very much like a, a corporate job. Mm -hmm. And what I realized was I worked very hard at it, but I wasn't being that successful at it. I mean, I was doing much of what I did before uh, in a corporate setting and corporate setting wasn't actually working uh, as an entrepreneur. And so it, it took a while to start realizing uh, I either made a big mistake here or, or, and I should get back into municipal corporate work or I got to figure this out. And uh, so as time started to, you know, go on, I, I figured out I need to, I need to embrace this work-life integration thing. So and how did you deal with, well, maybe not even how did you deal with it, but did you have, did you, did you have those moments of doubt that you had made the wrong decision? All the people who were saying, are you mad that they might've been right? I know you are mad. But <laughs> <laughs> oh, for sure. I mean, you know, as an entrepreneur, you, you can, you often live on a, on an island. Uh, there's people who are looking at you and saying, you know, you have X, Y, Z skill and you're really good at it. And you were getting paid six figures to do that. And now you have promptly walked away from that paycheck and all that security. And, uh, and you're trying what you're, you're going to do what? And for me, uh, you know, I walked away from a six figure income. I promptly proceeded to make $33,000 the next year. Uh, I thought to myself, you know, I, I just need to work longer and harder. And the next year, the second year, I made $33,000. And I thought to myself, I need to work longer and harder. And I was well on my way in the third year to making about $33,000. So, you know, coming home and your wife is kind of looking at your bills and you're playing what I call bill lottery and trying to figure out which ones you're not going to pay because you were making like $70,000, maybe $80,000 more, uh, you know, and now you're trying to juggle what bills are getting paid because you're not. Um, it takes a real faith in yourself. Uh, you've got to have a vision and you have to have a belief um, and you've got to see where the angle is that you are going to sell whatever it is that you've decided to be entrepreneurial about. And uh, sometimes even the people closest to you do not see your vision. And uh, so, you know, <laughs> it was a big gamble. Uh, but, you know, you have to have a belief in yourself that is, you know, unlike anything else you're probably going to face in your lifetime. And, uh, and if you can make it work, if you can see that angle, and if you believe in it enough, uh, more often than not, it works. So. And did you, when you were facing those challenges, you know, when you're looking at the third year and thinking, you know, okay, well, how many more hours can I put into this? And, you know, I, I'm still just earning 33K. Mm -hmm. um, did you admit to others about your doubt or did you kind of soldier on yourself or did you look outside for support and, and help? Well, that's where, yeah, interestingly enough, I've, you know, I, I don't know, I went through uh, a lot of foster homes when I was a kid and uh, I landed with this elderly couple when I was five. Um, they were, would have been my grandparents if it had been a natural birth scenario. Um, they had been through the dirty thirties and second world war. Um, they had lived some life, you know, they were well into their sixties when they took me in. So they had a lot of common sense. And one of the biggest things that they realized with, with me was that they were going to have to use, uh, they were going to have to have help 
to get me to really straighten my life out and become anything. And so they, their big pitch to me was mentors. And uh, so from a very young age, I learned the value of mentors, good mentors, role models in your life. So when I was going through my dry spell um, and really trying to get recreation excellence off the ground, all I could think was I knew a lot of people. I, I had done very well, like I said, in the corporate world of municipal recreation. I knew a lot of people. Um, I wasn't leveraging those people. I wasn't getting their feedback and not the people that were saying you're nuts to do this. It was the people who they were a bit entrepreneurial themselves, but they didn't have maybe the fortitude to actually walk away from the six figure income, but they could see how this could be done. And they wished actually that they could do it but they were almost living through me that I did this. I made this leap. I was the first one in Canada to kind of say, no way, I'm going to, I'm going to test this water. And so for them, it was kind of like, yeah, you go, man. But they were also very wise and they're very, very connected. So once I stopped trying to do it on my own and I, I reached out to some of these mentors and I, I said, listen, I'd like to do some workshops with you. I'd like to pick your brain. I'd like you to, if, if, if you were going to hire Recreation Excellence, what, what would you hire? Uh, like, what would you hire us for? How would you hire us? Where would you hire us? How could we do this? And so I held several open forums where many, I probably had uh, 20, 30 mentors come at various times and just do a workshop with me, a day workshop. And they actually led me to my new way of thinking, which was I had been kind of approaching municipal uh corporate as municipal corporate and that's not what they were looking for they were looking for different and uh they were looking for why can you do it better like how do you think you'll do it better and what what makes you think you can do it better and my whole thing was well i i can do it better because i can hand select the people i want to do it with and uh where in municipal government, that's not always the case. It usually isn't. I'm given a team and then I'm trying to make the team do what I want. What I do with recreation excellence is I, I have a philosophy and I hire people that fit in inside that philosophy. So once we started that and we got our first job and all of a sudden we started winning awards, uh, well, then people started to change their mind about that idea. And so 33,000 went to 133,000 to 333,000. So over a period of time, the belief in yourself, but reaching out to mentors was, was the thing that got me outside of my corporate thinking. Even though I was trying to be entrepreneurial, I was still corporate thinking. So then I became a real entrepreneur. And did you, when you were going to your mentors, did you... Did it feel like you were going and admitting failure to them, that you were going, I can't do this, I'm struggling, I, I need help? Or did it feel that you were coming from a position of strength that you had acknowledged that you needed help? How did, how did that feel to you, I guess, personally, to, to mm -hmm. need to be reaching out to them? Yeah, I think the need to be reaching out to them was the realization that if I, if I didn't think differently, I was going to fail. And so I had the talent. I had the, I probably had a good concept, but something was missing. It's like you can have this Rolls Royce sitting there, but if you don't have the right key, you can't drive it. And what I needed was the key. And I had all the, I had all the talent. I had all the idea of how to do this. I just didn't have the key. And what they gave me was the key. Here's the keys to your success. And uh, and once I realized, oh man, I've been approaching this uh, kind of 80% right. But, you know, if you're trying to get to the moon and you're 1% one, 1 off, you, you end up in Mars, not the moon, you know? And what they did was they just dialed it in and said, you know, if I was going to hire you, this is, this is what, here's the keys that you need to show me, you know? And uh, so, no, I, it was, I would say it was out of fear, you know, fear of failure, you know? Um, you walk away from a six-figure job, and uh, you, you got to wake up to a wife who has allowed you to do that. But she's starting to wonder, how are we going to pay our bills? You know, <laughs> and so there's a big responsibility, you know, in it as well. And it, 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 there's a risk to it. And you have to believe in yourself, though, and surround yourself with mentors who are going to help you get there. 
and it can be when you're when you're at that point when you're you're not sure that it's going to work that it hasn't been working it can be really hard to have that self belief and I, I think as you say, having those people around you who are helping you to reshape it, who aren't just telling you you're doing it right and don't worry, it'll happen, <coughs> Excuse me, but are actually helping you to identify, you know, how you present it is really important. And, um, and it's not always easy to find the right people. I know I've had some wrong people who have <laughs> given me assistance and it just, you know, hasn't worked. Um, if we look at rec recreation excellence today, have you built a company that is now in itself a corporate with a corporate behavior and mentality, or have you maintained a philosophy that is yours and more entrepreneurial, more Tom Watson? Yeah, no, I have actually uh, made it a mandate of our company to stay away from corporate. And uh, we think differently. We, we're always asking the question, why, um, how can we do something different? Um, why are we doing it the way we're doing it? Um, we, you know, we, we have systems that work we, you know, I would say, you know, don't, don't think every day we walk into work and we change everything up. Um, but we are constantly asking ourselves, why, why are we doing what we're doing? Who are we hiring? Why are we hiring that person? Uh, how do they think, you know? Uh, we'll have integrated meetings within our staff units uh, company-wide and uh, we've got things that one, com one company is doing uh, that is different than another company because one community is different than another community where a lot of municipalities uh, they just try to run it the same way everybody else is doing it they'll say well how does how does so-and-so do this and they all go research how so-and-so is doing it and they try to make that work in their community. And what I do is say, so who do we have in our community again? And how can we make that work for them? You know, and so our staff is much more uh, free to uh, create. It's more, it's an artistic way of looking at this service rather than uh, kind of a, a, you know, almost like a box form of service provision. Here's what we give you, you know, rather than, here's what we could create with you, you know? So. And, and, and so how do you give people, you, you know, so if you've got, you've got a job. Um, so, you know, one of your employees is in there, they know their job is to do, you know, whatever it is. And, and obviously as with any business, you need to be making money and, you know, you need to be delivering. Mm -hmm. and how do, how do they know and how do they act upon that freedom and that creativity to be looking at it and saying, well, well, hang on a second, you know, I'm watching the people who are coming in to use our facility or the people who aren't coming in to use our facility. And, and I think we need to make a change. How do they know that, um, not not no because sometimes people they they say the words but they don't actually uh, either they mean it but the people listening don't believe it um, or they don't really mean it so how mm -hmm. do they know that they can come whether it's to you or their manager or whoever and go hey I think we need to do something different here yeah so what we've got like program wise a lot of the services we provide are our program service um, so program service wide, we are always uh, taking care of our, our research on demographics. What, what's the new, and our, our demographics probably in your, your part of the world, your demographics are changing greatly probably as well as, as, as they are here in Canada. Um, so, you know, what we did 10 years ago does not necessarily at all, you know, matter today. Um, so staying abreast of our demographics, staying abreast of trends is, is the biggest thing for us. And I, I do a thing called, we, I call it baseball. So American baseball, you've got, you got programs, you got players on base, you got a dugout, you've got people in the dugout and we, we have programs that are on base, they're in play. And we are now researching those programs. We are monitoring are they still successful uh, are they are they going up in revenue and in attendance uh, are they plateauing is there anything we can do I call it an adjustment is there an adjustment we can make that will now shoot that program up another level or is that program just flatlined and eventually is it going to start to you know decline in, in participation and revenue and those types of things 
Meanwhile, we've got all these uh, in the, you know, in, in the box, uh, players box programs that we're, we're assessing and we're doing research on and who would this program be for and who would that program be for? How would we market that program? What ki kinds of equipment would we need to do that program? Uh, what's the demographics? How many people would be affected by that program? And we're already assessing, uh, our staff are already assessing their good ideas and they're prioritizing who's going to come back up, who's going to be the next player on, on base. What's, what's going to be the next program? As we retire a, a program, what's the program that's coming in? And so it's the freedom to be creative, to be researching. So part of that, of course, is you've got to say to yourself, well, that means I've got to, I've got to actually intentionally have research time, right, within my staff so they can be, to allow them to be creative, to allow them to find the right information, to allow them to put together a, a business plan for that next program that's going to impact people. And then how do we market? How do we go to market with that program? How do we tell people? Because a lot of programs, successful programs, is telling people that they need this program. They may subconsciously want it. They may actually need it. But until they're told that they need it and why, Sometimes they don't, you know, you could launch that without really telling them and marketing it up front and they might not, that program might not be successful. But uh, so it's a, there's a, a creativity to it uh, and it's ongoing all the time. And how do you balance that? You know, so I think again, for, especially for a smaller business as they're taking on employees, mm -hmm. it, how do you balance that time which says, you know what, you're doing whatever it is, a 35, a 40 hour work week. Um, and I accept that 10 hours of this or 20 hours or whatever the number is, is actually not productive in the sense of your, your job role. It's that research. It's, it's going to be productive. Um, I, I'm going to reap the benefits later um, if it all goes well. How do you yeah. balance that with the need to, be managing your costs, all those other aspects that you've now got essentially, you know, potentially a part-time person, um, but you're paying for them full-time. Yeah. And so part of that is, is recruitment in our business. It's recruitment. So, you know, you, you form a relationship with a very strong staff member and you, you, you know, when I say relationship for us in our company, relationship drives well down into who are they as a person, who are they as a family member in their private lives, who are they in our company as a family member. Um, so you build a trust relationship and it, it doesn't happen overnight. Uh, you have to be strategic and you have to be very intentional in forming your core team. Uh, if, you, if you put your money on the wrong horse, you're going you're gonna to pay the price for that. And so you really have to continually mentor uh, and grow a team that you can trust around you. You know, if you're trying to do it all on your own, uh, you know, if Tom Watson, I, I mean, I know I can do it, but I'm only going to be able to do it to a certain size. So I actually have to find like-minded people and then we have to grow together. You have to grow this work family together. Um, so that's part of it. Once you've found those people, that's what I've figured out is surrounding yourself with very talented people who understand your company, who understand your mission and your vision statements and your core values and your strategic plans. And they help you grow those strategic plans. Now you have some trust in them. And what they're doing is what I've asked my people to do is, okay, now you've got to find somebody who you can trust to grow a program. You know, so what's a program and now who who would be one of the better deliverers of that program? And so we build our, our program team by by reaching out to other skilled people. We form a platform that works and then we find people to to slot in there who can run that program. And uh, and they may be with us for a year. They may be with us for 10 years uh, until that program no longer is viable anymore and it's it's only viable if the, the public wants it to be viable you know so yeah you there's a risk in the the uh, kind of 40 hour a week employee if you want to use that as kind of the the benchmark of 
of just handing them something and and then hoping you're going to get you know you you want an apple and and you're saying give me an apple and and then you know kind of three months later you find out they they got you an orange and and so there there's this growth together and slow steps don't you know and be connected with them know what they're what they're doing know what they're thinking make sure they're drawing you an apple if that's what you're trying to get to i always say to my staff i don't care how you get to drawing the apple as long as it comes out and we all agree that's an apple and it didn't take you five years longer to get to the apple you know let's let's get to a product uh, let's make it a product that we can and not every product they come up with do we we all sit back at the end and we've we've done the research and we go you know we actually have a better product you know we actually have something else that we and so put your ego aside even my own ego i have to put my own ego aside because my staff come up with great ideas that i kind of look at when they start this drawing it out i'm like i don't really know if that's but I have to trust them. I've hired them. I've grown them with this company. They know what we need to do. Um, and at some point you have to say, okay, show me then, show me that. And sometimes I'm going, okay, well, let's take your apple over my apple, you know, put your ego aside, take the apple, you know, <laughs> so... And, and do you, having built up this trust and, you know, fostering this, I guess, self-empowerment uh, approach, do you think that's partly responsible for allowing you to evolve into the other aspects of your life in terms of your yes. better life and author, speaker and all of that? Is that, you know, a key, a key part of it? Oh, absolutely. I, I, uh, Recreation Excellence has become powerful enough and, and visionary enough, the senior staff now that, you know, I spend a fraction of my life actually um, managing that company, uh, which allows me to grow your better life, grow my consulting side of, of what I'm wanting to do and my speaking you know, uh, our mission and vision workshops, our customer experience workshops, uh, our, our keynote speaking engagements and writing books and, and uh, writing blogs and being on your show. And, and uh, you know, but you wouldn't be able to do that if, if you are, I call them uh, power mongers. If you're a power monger and, and nobody in your office can move unless you say move, um, you know, uh, you're not going to expand your business uh, much past your own your own capabilities because people are all, all going to be afraid to do anything. Um, you you there is risk in in this. You have to have checks and balances, and you have to have trusting trust in people and trust in people who you can trust and uh, who get what you you are trying to achieve with this company but i don't believe that many companies that are are doing who are larger companies and doing impactful things in the world uh the top guy that first began that company uh he's not functioning in the day-to-day -day trenches anymore he's the visionary he's helping uh, his senior staff become visionaries. They're becoming better visionaries. They're becoming, you know, lead visionaries with him. And he's off creating new opportunities, you know. So that's what I'm, I'm into now. That's fortunately what I've been able to grow a crazy idea uh, 20 years ago into, into today where we, we live a very... Uh, happy integrated life and uh we have great staff who are winning awards and and uh so yeah you know it it, it is a trust journey that you have to you have to uh, go on with with certain people who you you hand select and you get to know and they get to know you so and when you decided to start writing um man shoes how did that, you know, so as you alluded to before, you, you know, were a foster child, you went through quite a few foster homes originally, um, until you, you came to the family or, you know, the Watsons who, who really supported you from that point on. How did it feel? So were you expecting to actually write a book that you were going to put out 
and and sell or and and share all of those things, which in a lot of cases are, are you know very personal. Or were you doing it to to just get it out of your head to to almost give yourself some therapy of of writing it down? You know what what motivated you, Tom? Well, you know to be honest, uh, I was you know kind of six seven years into recreation excellence at the time and uh although i had started to smarten up uh in the way of doing business um i was still working really hard uh i was still stressed out uh, because you know we were doing better um but you know we we things were still fragile. I mean, we're five, six years into a business uh, that is still fragile. And uh, I wasn't taking care of myself. Um, you know, I wasn't, I wasn't living, uh, I really wasn't living the kind of integrated light and work life approach. Um, so it was mostly work. And, uh, and what happened for me was I, I, uh, my blood pressure went up, you know, I was, I uh, used to be very athletic and, and I had put on quite a bit of weight, uh, you know, I was stressed out, I was thinking about work all the time, and I had a, a small stroke, and, uh, and when that stroke happened, uh, my doctor told me, you know, you, you need to start taking care of yourself. And really, work-life integration came out of that six months of taking time off work. And unfortunately, at the time, uh, I had a couple of projects which had general managers in them that I could trust, uh, or everything could have gone sideways at that time. But those two people really became very, very important, uh, you know, pawns or key key chess pieces in in the war of of getting to be entrepreneurial and uh, while i healed i started thinking about my life and going through 13 foster homes and and um my first wife had passed away several years earlier and my my uh, oldest two sons brad and kelly um were from darlene uh i started thinking about them and what would they know of their mom if you know if dad something did happen to me uh, who's going to tell them, um, you know, the, how their mom and dad got together, all those types of stories. You see, for me as a foster child, those things are all missing. I don't have those stories. I don't know how, I don't even know my birth story. I mean, uh, there's so many things as a foster child that you actually have this big question mark about. And so it became important for me at that time to say, okay, I, I think I, I got this time and I'm going to journal out uh, for my boys, my three sons, how did I meet their, their mothers? Uh, who was their dad, all this stuff. So I did that. Uh, and I started doing that fairly early on in the recovery process. And, uh, meanwhile, I started to think about integration and how, if I'm going to do this business thing, continue to do business, I need to change the way I think about it. Um, so a lot of transformation, Um, because I had to, because I had to get healthier. And out of that came this large journal that uh, a few years later, several years later, actually a friend of mine and I would meet once a month for coffee. And uh, my friend said to me, you know, his daughters were getting older and they were graduating and, and he lamented to me one month. Um, he said, you know, Tom, uh, us guys, we just don't do a very good job of telling our, our kids who we are. And uh, so he was lamenting to me about how his daughters are getting older and how, you know, the, the ladies uh, in our lives do a better job of telling uh, their sons and daughters about themselves and their families and who they are and on and on and on. And I said, well, you know, I, I kind of solved that. And he said, well, what do you mean to solve that? And I said, well, I wrote this journal for my boys and I, I told them about, about me and my journey. And he said, well, can I read that? And I wasn't too excited about letting somebody else read my journal, but I did let him. He's a good friend. So I let him And a couple of weeks later. 
it was a Saturday morning and the phone rang and Kathy, my wife answered the phone and she called to me and she said, you know, it's, it's Barry. And I'm thinking, well, I don't think we have coffee today. So I, I picked up the phone and I said, Hey, am I missing coffee? I, I thought we were not on for another couple of weeks. And, and he said, no, he said, I just want to let you know that I, I read your book. And uh, I said, well, you mean my journal? He said, no, I finished your book. He said, that's the best book I've ever read. And uh, he said, you need to do something. Well, that was October and he bothered me for, well, till the following August. Um, every month we'd meet for coffee. He'd say, have you done anything with this thing, uh, with this book? And I would say, no, I haven't. And so finally I, I ripped out four or five pages out of the journal and I faxed them off to various publishing houses and as it turns out it, it got picked up and and over I think uh, May uh, 2011 it was uh, birthed into the marketplace and and uh, since then it sold a few hundred thousand copies of books and and uh, it has touched a lot of lives I get I, I get emails from from people in India I get emails from people in Ireland. I've had all kinds of emails and phone calls and text messages from people around North America. It's, it's, it's interesting how a, a guy's journey, uh, which he didn't intend to be public, was, has uh, kind of made a lot of a few hundred thousand people, maybe a few million people think about their life and, you know, and, and that journey of life that we're all on. So it's an interesting story. I, I mean, I certainly didn't set out to be a best-selling author, but it, it's turned out, and I'm happy to happy to be part of that journey. So, and I and I, I you know, I've read it, and as you say, it's it, um, it's an interesting journey. It's you know got a lot of very sad elements to it, and some you know really happy and positive things as well. And so it's good to see how you have evolved through and with the support of you know initially the Watsons and going you know forward and have changed your life as you you know mentioned earlier that you could have been so many things and not necessarily positive without them being in your life so it, it is a very inspirational story and, and how did it feel to be you know because I know you then went on to to doing some speaking about it um, and you did the the TEDx in in Chilliwack I think fairly recently mm -hmm. How does it feel to be standing in front of people and talking about some of those things which aren't actually deeply personal? You know, how do you, how do you deal with that without letting the emotions take over and also knowing that you you are essentially bearing your soul to people? Mm -hmm. You know, I, the sad thing I think about society is, is that we don't bear our souls to people. We uh, we have this uh, hi. This is Tom Watson, and then we have uh, behind the, the kind of the guise of Tom Watson. There's my life. You know, I think uh, entrepreneurial business tells you know uh, tells us or teaches us that we have to everything's perfect. Everything's going so so good. And, uh, you know, business is so, so, so good when really you're going back to your office and trying to figure out how you can pay a bill, you know, but you got to tell people it's so, so good because that's what sells for people. Um, when really each one of us is living this life where we're very complicated. Uh, we have things that are in our control that aren't going well. Um, sometimes we make a bad decision. Uh, sometimes life gives us some tough pills to take. And life is not perfect and it's not always going well for everybody. And not many people are willing to, to just open up and say, listen, um, you can be successful even though your life is a little bit like a pizza. It's a little bit messy. It can still be a really good pizza. And I think what I, happened for me when, when I wrote the journal, but actually more than when I wrote the journal, I, 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 I believe I probably started to feel a bit differently about myself when I wrote the journal but when I got the book deal and I actually just sat down and had to really flush out the chapters of the book uh, what I realized was uh, what people had told me or what I told myself or what the world had told me and I believed or however that happened was you got to get over these things and uh, 
So just get on with it, you know. And uh, what I realized was I wasn't over most of the things that were really deeply scarring me. And because I wasn't over them, I wasn't being my best version of me. And because I wasn't being my best version of me, I wasn't being the best husband. I wasn't being the best dad. I wasn't being the best brother or friend, you know. Um, as I wrote the book, uh, Kathy would come home sometimes and I, I, she'd leave in the morning and, and I'd be starting to write and she'd come home and I'd have red eyes and I'd, I must have looked pretty haggard some days because she'd say to me, so how did that chapter go? And uh, to be honest, I sat in, in my office and wrote that book over the course of a few months and man, there were some rough days in there because what I realized was I really actually hadn't uh, really dealt with that thing, uh, which was very traumatic. And uh, what writing about it did was force me to actually sit down and say, okay, so you're not over the fact that you went through 13 foster homes. Um, you're not over the fact that you were abused. Uh, you're not over the fact that you don't know who, you know, your family is, your birth family is. You're not over the fact that uh, your first wife passed away. Uh, you know, in, in a in a very sad way, you're you're not over a lot of this stuff, and so actually, really focus on each one of those things, and and reach out for counseling, and and my family would tell you now, you know, uh, six years after that book has launched, that I am a much much happier, much more at peace person uh, with myself, and that emits out into the universe that I'm I'm a way more approachable, way more likable, way more understanding, caring person than I ever was because I, I'm not walking around with all this baggage anymore. Like I I'm done with the fact that I'm I went through 13 foster homes. I'm done with the fact that I was physically and mentally and sexually abused. I'm done with it. You know, I've purged it out I've healed and yeah, that's my, my story, but it doesn't, how I started in life and the things that happened to me in life do not have to dictate the height that I can achieve in my life, uh, how high I soar in my life. And I think many of us get stuck with the thing that got us stuck in the mud and we get stuck in the mud because we can't ever see how we might heal from that and actually use that negative to be a positive. Um, in my life, I've used it a lot of what I've gone through to be a positive. Um, but I'm also able to sit down and listen to people tell their stories. And even though I don't know exactly what they're going through, I can imagine much of what they must be going through and I can empathize and sympathize and I can maybe throw in a little tidbit here and there. So, you know, it's been, uh, the book has probably been one of the most trans transformational uh, parts of my journey because it, it actually helped me heal, you know, and uh, oh, by the way, it helped a few million people heal too. So. <laughs> Which is really wonderful, Tom. And from my perspective, my feeling, and this might be wrong, is that it was the book that then led you on to your better life and the speaking mm -hmm. opportunities, that type of thing. Is that, mm -hmm. is that the case? Absolutely. Yeah. And, uh, you know, once you realize you have this voice uh, that people actually need, they needed the voice, um, then you're, you realize you have this responsibility, you know, I didn't, you know, uh, in, 20, in 2012, uh, I was the most interviewed author in North America. I didn't start out by writing a journal saying to myself, for my sons, I want to be the most interviewed author in North America in, in the year 2012. Um, I started off to tell my boys, who am I? And who is their dad? And how what mistakes have I made and what challenges have I faced and and almost give them like a, a playbook that says here's some things to avoid <laughs> you know <laughs> uh, and here's here's the fact that life can be tough right it's not going to be 
perfect and uh, and yet you can find perfection in imperfection right um so yeah the book actually made me realize wow i didn't realize this but actually people want to hear this they want to know they want to they want to take that story and they want to kind of look at themselves and they want to hear that story and they want to grieve they they want to they want to celebrate they want you know whatever it is that they want to do they want to get more connected with their spouse they want to get more connected with their kids they want to get more connected with their parents or their brothers or their, you know they, whatever it is that they are going through they want to get more connected and uh, and the only way to do that is to you know start healing yourself uh, it's a tricky journey this this life we live on this funny little world that we're in and so we run into things and and I think people need a story that says yeah bad things happen but I, I actually triumphed over that you know so and so can you <laughs> <laughs> No, and it, it is, it's always good when you, when you do read those things or you hear those things. And, and as you say, that you're looking at it and going, okay, uh, actually I can do this. What happened to me did happen to me. It doesn't define who I am or what I can do, which again, I think a lot of us do, we're held back, whether we realize it or not, um, by some of the things in the past. So having that, that story is, is very powerful. And I often say, Deborah, oh, sorry, I often say, you know, what happened to me is not what, what defines me, right? Uh, I have an opportunity to redefine myself every day. And uh, I can choose, you know, my choice plus my actions equals my life. You know, if I choose to let this negative thing or this negative person or this negative event in my life define me, then it will. And if I choose to say, you know what, that's good education. I, I, I learned a tough lesson. Um, and I'm going to use that tough lesson to further advance myself. And then, you know, then that's, that's something worthwhile taking with you. Yes, because otherwise you can get hung up on the bad lesson, but not take the learning from it. It just becomes a barrier yeah. or something to avoid in the future. Yeah. So with, you've mentioned, I think earlier that you've got, is it a couple books coming out in the next couple of years? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So what, what yeah. are those on, Tom? So um, I've got uh, one coming out, which is, is going to be From Handshakes to Hugs. Uh, so I love that one because, because it's all about the customer experience. And um, so for, uh, for people who, you know, whether it's, uh, smaller businesses, uh, kind of mid-sized businesses, or even for big uh, corporations. The concept uh, that really I think we all have to realize is that we have these, uh, these customers, these available customers to, uh, to us. To, uh, to grow your company, you've got to be able to say, okay, I'm going to meet Deborah today. Uh, Deborah and I don't know one another. Uh, I would like to woo Deborah in as a customer. Um, so how do I do that? Well, we're going to shake hands. Deborah is going to say hi, and she's going to put her hand out, and I'm going to say hi. I'm going to put my hand out, and our two hands are going to touch. We're going to shake, and you're going to say, I'm Deborah, and I'm going to say, I'm Tom. And by the end of that meeting, uh, our initial meeting, if Deborah isn't saying to herself, I want to hug this guy, or I'm not saying I want to hug Deborah. Um, whether we physically hug or we emotionally hug, that's the difference between uh, growing your business or not growing your business. And I don't think most of us as entrepreneurs take enough time to actually say, how do I go from a handshake to a hug? And when organizations that are procuring your service are running on tough times uh, or they're looking at their bottom line and saying we need to improve the bottom line what do we do you know do we what staff do we lay off what service providers do we lay off 
um, and they look at your company and they say, hmm, wow, there's that Tom Watson. Uh, man, I really don't want to let him go. You know, now they're hugging you. But if you're just a handshake, uh, they're going, okay, uh, can Joe do that? Okay, cut Tom. And so handshakes to hugs is really the, the journey from starting uh, what I call the experience process for your customer, whether that be a client you're serving or if you've got thousands of customers that walk through the door like I do every day uh, into our facilities, starting that journey with them. So that at the end of the day, when they're thinking about cutting something, it's not just a handshake for them. You know, okay, you gave me what I paid you to give. No, they actually are invested inside of you where they're actually, it hurts them to let you go. And so, uh, so Handshakes to Hugs, I, I think it's going to be a great uh, book to kind of explore how do you build teams? How do you form teams that actually love to serve? How do you form a uh, service that turns into experience uh, for, for customers that says to them, you're important. Did you feel important when you, when you were working with us? Because you're important. And uh, so that's the first one that should come out in the next year. Um, my next one is Man Choose the Next Step. And that's two thirds written. And it's really actually about becoming an empty nester. You know, uh, our three, Kathy and I have three boys and uh, they're all out of home now. And this is in Canada, well, North America, probably, maybe in the UK. Uh, our divorce rates are up around 60, 63%. Most of them are happening between the ages of, you know, kind of 40, 45-ish to 55-ish. Most of that's because kids are all leaving home and couples have hung on to this uh, dead relationship uh, for three, four, five years. Uh, they aren't talking to one another. They're not being with one another they don't even know who one another are anymore their kids leave and they get divorced and uh so man choose the next step is this journey into the next part of your, our lives together kathy and i uh there's uh, we reflect back on being parents um the fun times the tough times the you know there's some funny stuff in there and uh and then what do you do how do you how do you become vibrant again as a couple uh if if you've lost some vibrancy how do you rekindle that and uh i think it'll be a fun book uh for people who are or who liked man shoes in particular and they want to know you know where where's that tom watson uh family gone from here and uh and i think it'll actually spur on some some thinking in regards to a lot of a lot of different aspects of life from your career to uh, how do you talk to one another as, as a couple, um, to sex? I mean, every man loves the, the, the S word, uh, you know, though all of that kind of stuff, like how do you keep yourselves vibrant as you move into these, uh, more senior years of your lives? So, so those are the two books and, uh, really looking forward to getting them out. I know. And they sound very different, but both very interesting in their, in their own ways. Mm -hmm. um, and actually, I know somebody who over here is, um, she's a divorce consultant. So she, she works with people who are divorcing and she has posted some things recently about the rise of, you know, divorce in the, the later years. So it hits exactly with that. So I imagine it, it's the same situation in the UK as, as you guys are facing in North America. Um, Sadly. <laughs> yeah, it's very sad. Uh, mm -hmm. but, but it's also understandable because if you become that identity of mom and dad and, and you haven't fostered the relationship of, you know, in your case, Tom and Kathy, then it's kind of understandable that you may have lost sight of, of who each other is. And, mm -hmm. and you might have discovered that actually you, you've grown apart rather than growing together. So, I, you know, I think hearing what you and, and Kathy have done in your experiences will be, you know, of interest to people. Um, yeah, which is great. And the the customer experiences one from from handshakes to hugs. Again, I know that a lot of people over here in those smaller businesses, again, when they're starting out, find it quite difficult to, you know, you kind of come out of that corporate as you did um, or the municipality and you're going, OK, well, I'm going to sell you this. 
Yeah. Um, and, and we're so focused on just wanting you to, to buy it that we're not thinking about what that relationship is, what that experience is for them and, and how we're giving them what they what they want rather than necessarily what we know they need. So uh, again, I can see that being, you know, incredibly valuable, Tom. Um, I think a lot of people, a lot, a lot of us entrepreneurs um, maybe have taken, uh, you know, taken a wrong approach, uh, Deborah, is that we think our product is what they need. And really what they want is a relationship. And oh, by the way, they needed this thing. But I think all of us as entrepreneurs need to realize that not very many of us are in uh, a product sales position where our product is the only one of its kind on earth. And so why is it that we go to get our hair done where we get our hair done? Why is it that we eat in certain places? Why is it we buy cars from certain dealers? Why do we buy what we buy where we buy it? There's a reason we do that. And most of us don't actually even understand that in our psyche, in the back of our mind, we have a set of criteria as to why we buy where we buy. And you either meet that criteria or you don't meet that criteria. And so Handshakes to Hugs is, is exploring the idea of creating a culture within your organization where people come in and they say, I feel good here and I want to be here and I want to buy your product. Oh, by the way. So this is an aside. Yes, I'll give yeah. you some money. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. And it's true because I know that there are a few places that I go to, um, you know, when I don't want to be working at home and I, I want to just go and sit somewhere else. And I have different places depending on, on how I'm feeling that day. So there's one place that I can only go if I don't have the dog, but I like it because actually they don't speak to me very much there. And it's actually strangely quite loud, but I get a lot of work done. Whereas mm -hmm. today I went, because as I mentioned to you before, I had the dog, he's injured at the moment. And I chose a place to go that I knew that they knew him um, and mm -hmm. that they knew me and that there would be almost that um, affection, if you like, yeah. wondering what was wrong with him. And, and so you choose those things, even yeah. though all I did was actually go somewhere, have a drink, um, and, you know, do a bit of work, which I could have done in any number of places. So yeah. it's, it's a really true point. Yeah. So, Tom, it's been really interesting talking to you. And I just wanted to see before we wrap up, is there anything that you'd like to say to, you know, the small businesses out there, whether they're just starting up, whether they're in the process of establishing themselves? Any final tips or words? Yeah, I, I think the first thing I would say, Deborah, is you, you have to believe in you um the the toughest uh all of us would love to have a product that we we put out there and it is all of a sudden without it's it's the harry potter product and and it, it without even trying it's selling millions and millions of dollars worth of of product and unfortunately for us as entrepreneurs most of us that is not going to happen and so you have to believe in yourself first you have to believe in your product you are your product and so you have to believe in yourself because you're going to have all kinds of doubters that are going to say what are you doing just go get a job just go get a regular job and entrepreneurs are not regular type people so believe in yourself and and you gotta you might have to put it on your mirror I put it on my mirror uh, in my bathroom. I believe in me. And every day I would get up and go brush my teeth and read, I believe in me. Because a lot of people didn't believe in me. And so, so have faith in yourself. You have to be wise enough to know, do you have a product that you can sell? What are you selling? And is it a wanted product? Um, can you make it a wanted product? That, that, much of the world might say, well, I don't see where that product, where that product's going to go. But if you can see where the product's going to go, then that might happen. 
So believe in yourself, believe in your product, and then you got to create a culture that handshakes to hugs where people want your product and they want to keep that product as long as they can possibly keep keep it they would stop they would stop going to starbucks so many times or i don't know you have starbucks over there we have starbucks (laughs) okay so they would stop going to starbucks five times a week if they could just keep you on for a few hours a week you know and uh so handshakes to hugs it's your personality how do you wiggle into their heart and make your product and your service valuable so it's it's a journey it's an exciting journey enjoy the journey work integration life integration so work and life integration um believe in yourself believe in your product and handshakes to hugs so okay yeah no that's really wonderful tom thank you very much for starting your day with me um, yeah I really enjoyed it um well, thank, then, sorry, thanks for having me on thanks for having me on deb it, it's been lots of fun a uh, great way to get back into the swing of uh, work-life integration here in canada from from our trip to mexico so You've been listening to Deborah Levitt on Bridging Gaps, the business podcast.